Hi all, this is Dennis, and today you are back on my channel. In this video, I'll show you how to make a simple DC-DC boost converter with your own hands. With it, you can increase 12 volts DC to 24, and if you change something in the circuit, you can get more. In this case, the voltage at the output of the converter will be stabilized. It will not change under the influence of the load, and the input voltage can change even more, even down. But the most important feature here is that at the output, you can get two voltages independent of each other. And each output is designed for a power of about 24. My boost converter circuit looks like this. As you have already noticed, it is symmetrical and therefore not so complicated. Its basis is the good old symmetrical multivibrator. It serves here as a generator of high frequency pulses. Each arm of the multivibrator controls its own circuit to increase the voltage. The supply voltage of 12 volts is supplied from above and below and the output of the converter will be on the left and on the right. There we will receive 24 volts. The output voltage of each arm depends on the Zener diodes ZD1 and ZD2. Only to lower the Zener diode, you need to take a little more. For example, not 24 volts, but 25. The voltage will drop across the transistor junctions, so the output voltage will be slightly less. By changing the Zener diodes, the output voltage can either be increased or decreased. But keep in mind that you cannot get below the input voltage here. 12 volts is the lower limit. Also, the shoulders can be adjusted to different tension. For example, make one output at 20 volts and the other at 30. But if only one output is needed, then half of the circuit can be removed. As I said, the power of each arm of the circuit is approximately 24 watts. But to get more power, the shoulders can be combined. To do this, the pluses of both outputs must be connected with a jumper. And then it will be possible to receive the maximum current, not 1 ampere, but 2. In this case, the total power will be 48 watts. This is already decent power, and if you lower the voltage to 19 volts, you can charge your laptop in the car. You can also power some powerful LED lights, LED strips, 24 volt fans, and audio amplifiers. You can see the ratings of all the details of the circuit on your screens. Now I will tell you more about the assembly. I assembled the converter on a DIY board. Almost all the details are placed symmetrically. It turned out nice and compact. Instead of one 24 volt Zener diode, I used three connected in series. Only each is designed for less voltage. Electrolytic capacitors for 1000 microfarads, I put 25 volt. But it's better to put it in reserve at 35 volts. Choke L1 and L2 will need to be done by yourself. I will now tell you more about this. For the first one, I will use such a ferret core. I took it from the board of a fluorescent energy saving light bulb. Also, similar cores can be found in ATX computer power supplies. Note that there is a non-magnetic gap between the middle posts. In my case, its width is about one millimeter. If you don't have such a gap, then you can make it by placing pieces of paper under the side columns of the core. In this case, the gap will not be one millimeter, but 0 0.5. The gap is needed so that the inductor does not remagnetize and does not go into saturation. Otherwise, the throttle will lose its properties. It will cease to be reactants and a short circuit will occur. I unwound my native winding since there were a lot of turns of thin wire in it, and wound up a new one. The wire used was about 0.7 millimeter in diameter and made 60 turns. Then I inserted the core into the frame and pulled it off with tape. 
The inductance of the coil should be about 130 micro henry. I will wind the second choke on a ferret dumbbell. Here I make 70 turns, also with a 0.7 millimeters wire. The inductance is the same as the first inductor 130 micro henrys. You can also use yellow rings for the throttle. They are made from powdered iron. They can be found in computer power supplies. The number of turns there will be different. They will have to be found by experience. The main thing is to get the necessary inductance. Also, you can still take ferret rings, but they will have to deal with. They cannot be used in this form. For them to work properly, you need to saw through the gap. This is a very laborious job, so I do not recommend taking it on. In the process of working on a powerful load, the transistors will not heat up slightly. Therefore, they must be put on a radiator. Both transistors are connected to the heatsink via thermal pads. And the screws are isolated from the transistors through dielectric washers. Without washers and gaskets, two transistors cannot be connected to one radiator. If you do not have them, then the radiator will have to be divided into two parts. I soldered the wires to the board, and now you can apply power to it. I turn it on and note that at idle, no load at 12 volts, the circuit consumes 41 milliamps. That's about half a watt. First, I look at the voltage at the first output, here 24.3 volts. And then on the second, here 24.2 volts. As you can see, the difference is very small, only 100 millivolts. Now I will connect low power light bulbs and see how stable the output voltage is. As you can see, the light is on and the voltage has not subsided. I'll turn off the multimeter for now and see what's on the second output. And here everything is still the same. The tension has not changed a bit. Now I will demonstrate what will happen if a short circuit occurs. With a small conclusion, I will bridge the plus and minus, but only for a second. As you can see, after that everything works again and nothing burned out. But this is on condition that my power supply went into overload protection. If your power supply is very powerful, then most likely something in the converter can burn out. The same thing will happen if the circuit is powered by a battery. Therefore, one must be very careful not to short the output. But two positive wires can be jumpered, there is nothing to worry about. It's just that their power will add up. I checked the converter on the bulbs. Now we can move on to the real test. Here I have connected the electronic load. With its help, you can load the converter to maximum power. Rotating the regulator gradually increases the power. Let's calculate what efficiency our scheme has now. At a voltage of 24.2 volts, the current is 350 milliamps. This is approximately 8.5 watts. And the input is 12 volts and 980 milliamps. This is almost 11.8 watts. It turns out that the efficiency is 72%. I increased the load further. With a current consumption of almost 700 milliamps, the efficiency is 75%. I increased the load even more and bring it to almost 25 watts. At the input, the converter consumes 2.8 amperes. That's almost 34 watts. Here the efficiency is already 73%. If you increase the load further, then gradually the voltage begins to sag. With a voltage of almost 23 volts and a current strength of 1.6 amperes, the power is 37 watts. At the input, 
the current rises to 4.5 amperes and at 12 volts it is 55 watts. Efficiency drops very strongly to 67%. The voltage drop at the output can be compensated by applying a little more voltage to the input. Not 12 volts, but let's say 15. Due to this, the power of the converter is increased. And the efficiency rises to 77%. It turns out that the efficiency of this converter is greater if the difference between the input and output voltage is smaller. Thanks to this, the converter is also convenient to use in a car, since the voltage there is not 12 volts, but always a little more. I will reduce the load to 24 watts and see what happens. Now with a load current of 1 ampere, the efficiency will be 80%, and not 73 as it was before. This is already better since the converter will heat up less. Now I will give a small load and see how much the output voltage will sag if I reduce the input voltage. Now 12 volts. Now 11, the output voltage is still normal. 10 volts, the voltage is holding. But at 9 volts, the output voltage sags to 22. Even taking into account the fact that the current consumption is only 160 milliamps. If the load is reduced, the voltage returns to normal. If the converter is loaded with a large load, then the voltage starts to sag very strongly. The pressure rises, but only slightly. Now to increase the power, I connected both outputs with a jumper. With this connection, the converter easily delivers 24 volts and 2 amps. If the load is increased further and the current is about 3 amperes, then the voltage sags to 22 volts. Now back to the diagram again. I will add a few words on the characteristics of the parts. Coils L1 and L2 do not have to be exactly 130 microhenries. The inductance of the coil can be made smaller, but then the efficiency of the circuit will be very small. And even with the smallest load, the parts will heat up. If the inductance is increased, for example, to 150, then the power of the circuit will decrease. It will no longer deliver 24 watts from one arm. But the efficiency of the circuit will increase slightly. If you still don't need such converter power, then you can do so. The inductor core can be taken smaller and wound with a thinner wire. If you don't have an inductance meter, you can make one yourself. I have a video on my channel to create it. The link will be in the upper right corner and in the description. Also, diodes can be changed to any fast-acting ones, for example FARTA 302. Or if the load current is even less, then you can use FAR 107. Zener diodes can be used any, even Soviet ones. The same goes for bipolar transistors. You can take either KT315 or KT3102. It will also work on them, but the output voltage will sag a little more. In this circuit, it is better to use transistors with a gain greater than 400. Field effect transistors can also be taken by others. The main thing is that they fit the characteristics of current and voltage, but it is desirable to still use the IRF3205 with them, in this circuit, the output voltage is kept more stable. When using other transistors on a large load, the voltage starts to sag a little. Slightly, of course, but exactly 24 volts will no longer be. Be aware that the inverter will get very hot at maximum load. As I showed earlier, when there are 24 watts at the output, 34 watts are consumed at the input. The difference between input and output is 10 watts. All this power will be converted into heat. It will stand out on diodes, chokes, and most of all on field effect transistors. 
but if you load both outputs to maximum power, then the heat generated will double. Therefore, to cool the transistors, you will need to use a larger radiator. That's all for today. If you do not understand something, then ask questions in the comments. Subscribe to my channel, put likes and bye-bye.